Okay, uh, I'm here with uh, Giovanna B.C. Rosenfeld. Bossi, bossi. Bossi, bossi. Like yes. the leader. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like the leader. Okay. And uh, we're in, standing in front of the synagogue, uh, the Grand Synagogue. What's the official? It's the Synagogue of Florence, the only one. The Synagogue of the Florence. The Synagogue of Florence, the, actually, it's only one. <laughs> the one and only, okay. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to start by asking you, when did Jews first arrive in the city of Florence? Uh, it's hard to answer this question because we have lack of documents. We know some documents concerning 13th century, 14th century, but not a clear idea of how many and if they really were resident or people going from a city to another one. There were tombs. i show you where. Uh, out of the city was, but non clear if there really was a cemetery, so that should be for a larger number of people. We assume, <clears throat> because they were not allowed, like anywhere else in Italy, to be inscribed to artisan corporation, artisan guild, that essentially they were sometime medical doctor. We have a document of a medical, Jewish medical doctor that had a business with the Christian pharmacist in Florence in 1400. So we have a signed document by both of them in our city archive. And mostly they were merchant. We have an official date that we consider the official birth date of presence of resident Jews in Florence, <coughs> uh, 1437, when during the time of the beginning of the great political importance of the Medici family that were, yes, part of the Republican government of the city, but they were by facto ruling the government of the city. <coughs> when 1437, Jews were few Jews, there were originally three, then a fourth reached them, officially invited <coughs> as money lenders to substitute Christian in the same activity that was prohibited. Okay. Why this? And because the church was screaming against a usury and this and that, so consider that bankers like Medici and other were untouched by the screaming of the official church because they never dealt with poor. Huh? So money lender, in, in, wherever Jews were allowed to stay, city by city, some earlier, Florence later than Pisa and Siena, they were, the, the government invited Jews to replace the Christian in the same activity. Where did Jews get this wealth? the capital to lend money? But through the, the capital to get money, uh, well, few of them, one of them who was in some way the first invited to create. We have a name? True, I don't remember now by heart. But, but there we, is a name. Absolutely, yes. Because, this is written. Sure, because these people, to get, a fi like, like Christian earlier, to get such an official a rule in the city, they were usually, uh, there was one pawn shop per quarter, they had to sign a contract. So uh, being invited in some way, we can write, say between commas, they obtained what they wanted, a contract of tenure, they could buy small property, they were just a money lender, non their servant, not obliged to wear any mark. And so name by name, we know when and how, etc., etc. One of them already had an activity in a small town near Florence as money lender. And where did these initial Jews practice their religion? Uh, that is very, not very easy to tell you, but uh, this is the map of my <coughs> Jewish itinerary in Florence that I made for the community a few years ago. Let's say that since more or less then, a little later, a little before 1437, is not clear, a street on the other side of the river started to have a popular denomination, the Street of the Jews, hmm. which means that most of them live there. Is that street still called the same? No, today? It, the, that denomination finished many, many years ago. Hmm. It's now, you find here in the list, following the number, the name of the street, and in that street, if you go there, 
there is a plaque on the wall uh, written in English and in Italian. Tell us a little bit the story of this. Is there any depiction of Jewish activity in paintings that we might see in the Uffizi or any Renaissance uh, artworks? Uh, hard to tell you now. Let's say Jewish activity strictly many doubts. We have obviously Christian interpretation of uh, Tanakh, let's say. What's Tanakh? Tanakh is the so-called Old Testament for Christians. So we have um, something from the Torah, interpretation, etc. It's the most famous, but it's Christian interpretation of Hebrew text that because they mm, were uh, absorbing Christian culture, were reinterpreted. So there were no Jewish artists active during uh, the Renaissance? Yes, no. During Renaissance, or before? you know that they could not depict animal and human being. So uh, it was non... At that time there was only religious painting? There was no possibility to depict they other things? They could not. Let's say it was not an art in, uh, in which Jews... Jews were uh, having good reason to, to work. I mean, the, 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 the real art could be in uh, using Hebrew letter or ornaments when they wrote, when they started to publish some book, etc., etc. But most of the time were Christian publishing books for uh, Sidurim, uh, I mean, uh, prayers, book, buongiorno, uh, prayer books, etc., etc., um, Do we have any records of those? See, we have. We have in a very famous. We also have Hebrew parchment in few libraries in Florence. We have some material. But um, speaking about this, I'm not. The, I'm not very, very expert of this. But we know for sure that later, yes, when the emancipation started to be in Florence, so um, especially. 1800, eh, 19th century. Yes, we have very, very famous artists in, that were active in, that studied in Florence, were active in Tuscany, etc. But up to then, Jews were not known to be artists. Well, someone else, a philosopher, medical doctor, yes. Did they have the any court, other... uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo de' Medici, they were. Did Jews. they have any other contribution to the Renaissance besides doctors, philosophers? Si. In terms of, uh, were they creating the paint, or were they, uh, in terms of merchants or bankers, were they financing the Renaissance in any way? Well, uh, in Florence, uh, it's hard to answer this question specifically. I'm better expert of uh, 19th century, so I'm sorry, but not really very much because they could have called someone to yeah we know but those who contributed for they were converted Jews so Jews that left the community late 1500 there was a famous story of a rabbi of late 1500 when the ghetto was already established he converted and his sons too so and they were prote uh, conversion existed obviously but there was a ghetto here the way there is yes, in, in there Rome and Venice yes with Completely distinct boundaries Pardon? with distinct was it walled ghetto uh, not exactly walled but i will show you through the model how it worked and it was walled but known in the sense that as a Rome or as Venice because of other structure and there were very few Jews here not as many as in Rome or as many as there were in Venice. So, in general, from the Renaissance, how have Jews been perceived and well, treated? Well, let's say, in Florence, not too bad, because uh, but the golden era of the uh, rule of the Me Medici, let's say, protected Jews always because of their interest, obviously. But uh, the study of Lawrence, Lorenzo de' Medici, Lawrence the Magnificent, the same age of Leonardo and Botticelli, I mean, the great first patron of the two artists and patron of the very young Michelangelo. So he was an intellectual, mm. good political man, 
definitely terrible administrator of the wellness of the family, was much more interested to uh, politics, obviously, but um, intellectual uh, field in some way. Uh, not only art, but poetry, philosophy, etc. And at the court of Lorenzo, I don't mean in his palace, but as his time in Florence took place, few times, intellectual meeting between Christian and Jewish scholars. So there was not only at the court of Lorenzo, but we are speaking about Florence, other great personality, are the great prince, let's say, that had, a, you know, Italy was divided in city-states, I mean, land, state, and so. So depending on their <clears throat> open mind, they had this kind of aptitude. And in some way, he protected Jews also when they were risking, as usually could happen, when the great uh, preachers, uh, friars against the usury. And Savoia. Again, Savonarola, yes, Savonarola, not when Savonarola uh, preached against uh, the <clears throat> money, land, but they were preaching against. Uh, Jews, but not only Jews, they were preaching against the money lending business ruled by private people. They were, there was a movement of friars, the Franciscan mostly, that supported the idea of public pawn shop or very low interest to pay. So there was there corruption? Was, a kind, eh? was there corruption? Obviously, what, what do you mean? You are here. In, 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 in a <laughs> corruption has nothing to do with this. In terms of why would Savoia, Savona... No, Savonarola was an idealist. Why is he so active against uh, Savonarola, if you can help you, I mean, last year was the anniversary. 500th anniversary of Luther. Yeah. And if you go in the city where <coughs> Luther started preaching against, there is a famous statue where at the bottom, one of the four members... Uh, supporting the glory of Luther ah. was Savonarola. So Savonarola was a reformer, right. a okay. fanaticist only. No, he was not a corrupt person at all. He was fanaticism no, for saying Puritan. The corruption in the city at the time that led him to not, want to reform. No, no, the, the church corruption, not the city ruler corruption. Okay, that was the reform exploded in the Christian world against the Church of Rome, all the privileges and everything, etc., etc. So, Northern Europe, break, uh, made a break, etc. Okay, Giovanna, let's talk a little bit about this uh, uh, synagogue. It's, it's very big. Uh, it's a little... It's important. Si. The fact that you have a synagogue this big in a city like that is an indication that Jews didn't have it so bad here. No, in fact, they, they had... A, and also, it's interesting to tell you that... Um, in uh, Florence area, in Tuscany, after the end of the Medici rule, government, let's say, that extinguished with the last Medici Grand Duke, they were substituted by the Habsburg, the Austrian, since mid of 18th century, through an Lorena. international tre yeah, treaty um, between uh, the Lorena uh, and Habsburg and Spain and France, because don't forget Italy was divided, protected by all this nation. We had them ruling here. And they were at the time, mid of 18th century, obviously, um, more, much more between the more open mind Catholic ruler in Europe. And they started step by step to give a high level of emancipation to Jews. So when this was designed, was about 100 years later. So what year are we talking about? I'm speaking about 1750. Designed. <clears throat> no, 1750 when the gov the new government, the Austrian government in Florence, gave the permission. The ghetto was on by the Medici first and the Habsburg afterward. No? In this area where At, we are no, now? No, 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 no. Down the city centre. Ah. At a point in time, the Habsburg sold the two synagogues, two small synagogues existing in the ghetto, it, um, the Italian synagogue and the Spanish synagogue, to the Jewish community. So they got the first act of property of something in the ghetto. Later, 15, <coughs> excuse me, 1752, Jews received the keys of the ghetto gates. So they were and free. Later, uh, yeah, 
They could open up. They could open and close whenever they wanted. And step by step, they could even leave out. And better than anything, they could be inscribed finally to the artisan corporation. So few of them started to become wealthier and wealthier. And 1779, the genial <coughs> Grand Duke, always Habsburg, Grand Duke of the time, sold the ghetto to the Jews. So something that happened here earlier than in any other land of Italy, for what I know, honestly. And what happened was that was a, a, a great thing because being owning the land and the house, not the land, the houses of Prior the ghetto. Prior to that, they weren't allowed to own uh, land? And not. Okay. I mean, the, the, the purpose of ghettos, forget Venice. Venice ghetto has a complete different idea, um, origin and purpose, but the ghetto in Rome is strictly linked to the counter-reformation of, of the Catholic Church. And at the time, 1555, the purpose was to have in Rome that the same Pope that set up the first ghetto in Rome with the purpose to force Jews to convert, mm. okay, prohibited them plenty of activity. It was not like in Venice because the purpose was to make them poorer and to oblige them to live in a miserable area to force them to convert. Mm. Okay. Mm. And same in Florence. So there's this dichotomy between the wealth, <coughs> the moneylenders, and the poverty. But moneylender could not do officially. And don't forget that under the table many other things happened. But officially it was prohibited in Florence. <coughs> after the ghetto was set up, was prohibited to officially be money lender for Jews. They could only sell and buy second and stuff and be a medical doctor for their community, for, for Jews. Now, at the time, were all Jews practicing? Well, good question. Has been, it's, it's a question of instinctive answer. When a minority called them minority, because a group of people that <coughs> is having a different religion, va bene, in this case, Jewish religion, usually try to stay Thai, and they look at each other. So you have to assume they were practicing more strictly, even for a question of inter-society. Was there any way to distinguish a Jew from a Catholic physically? Sure. See, since early 1200, the Pope of the time wanted, I mean, suggested, because Pope, Pope could not oblige, I mean, they were, they were suggesting the Jews were distinguished with some special mark. Which kind of mark? non specified. So each city could choose whatever they want. In, uh, in many places, Florence too, for what we know, they used to distinguish themselves wearing a kind of oval shape, uh, a yellowish color piece of fabric so on, the, on, the, on the jacket, etc. But it could be different time by time. Do what? we know why they chose yellow? Was that the cheapest fabric or no, the easiest No, yellow, fabric? it's easy to see. It just... Yellow, it's easy to uh, see. Red, orange? Sometime, but not in Florence. For what I know, I, I'm honest. So Florence was the first to use the yellow? Absolutely not. Ah. Don't ask me, because I think they started to use this first in the north. I mean, it's not part of the kind of archive research I do. And there are no really written... Proof. It's difficult, yes. It's okay, difficult so to tell. Okay, so Giovanna... Let's Let's yeah, have a, please. Yeah, take, take me... Uh, Alors, tell me about why this? this? And this is the second big synagogue in Italy. The very first big is in Trieste. It's the first between the big, big, big ones <coughs> that was built on 1874-1882. And it's amazing because only eight years to big it, thanking the enormous donation left by the president of the community of the time. The dimension is enormous. The number of seats, more or less, is still the same. 2,000, I, I guess, or a little less than 2,000. Because when it was conceived, and it started to be conceived, a great new synagogue since mid of 1800, 
it happened because the ghetto was still existing, but the synagogues there were two, but very small. So the, the, the number of Jews in Florence at the time, it's hard to tell you because we don't have a census of them, should have been a little less than 2,000. So they wanted to have... They wouldn't build a synagogue this big if there weren't that many I don't practitioners. Think, I don't think... I mean, as an architect, I can tell you they could fit 2,000 people even if they made it a little smaller. So it's not only because of the number of seats they needed. It's also because... It was a kind of proud, proudness. Hmm. What happened? The don't Jews forget, were showing off. Don't forget what happened, the unity of Italy. And uh, step by step, 1860, March 1860, not by war, but by a plebiscite, the region of Tuscany voted a majority of the men, all men voted for the first time in our history, all men, for uh, the annexion to the just born. Uh, uh, United Kingdom of Italy, that was Piemonte and Torino, the king there. So, so Jews voted in that as well? Absolutely. So uh, uh, yes, 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 they so voted, they voted. At for that what I know. time, they were viewed as Italian citizens? Pardon? Italian no, citizens? No, uh, see, they started since then. Okay. In Tuscany, they were, had, had citizen rights in 1859, <laughs> and they voted, therefore. But, let's say, in other city, they needed... As soon as the land started by war, like Old South and Italy, or by annexion, uh, they were part of the United Kingdom. At that point in time, citizens had um, all rights, Jews, Protestant too, as well as Catholic. But you have to wait. There were no Muslims then. Probably yes, but Muslims usually converted step by step. There were since the times of the time there were slaves. Don't forget the slaves or the black, etc. They, they had. I mean, and <clears throat> it was that was the first group of people who converted. That's for sure. So, what are the inscriptions we see on the facade? The Ten the, Commandments. The Ten Commandments. See the short and but um, it's interesting because the this synagogue. It's really enormous for a community that, we don't know, but probably did not even want 1,800 people. Today, the population, I mean, the number of Jews affiliated, non-family, single, even kids, I mean, as well as old people, is a little less than 900 people. Today. Today. So, there was the double of population, but also a, an enormous level of proudness when this was built, and it's the first enormous, enormous modern, let's say, after the Emancipation Synagogue that was built. So this predates the synagogue in, in Rome. Rome. 20 years earlier. It was finished 20 years before. Now, but in Rome, there was not only that synagogue. The Spanish synagogue. There were others. No, uh, the one in Rome, uh, the, um, the service, you know, I mean, uh, we call it Minag. Here is Sephardi, Spanish, I mean. In Rome is Italian. Ah. Don't forget the Italian Jews, you know the story. <laughs> Italian Jews are called the Roman Jews that existed, documented in Rome, as you guess know, since more than 2,200 years ago. So the first group of Jews that established officially in Florence were Roman origin, and we call them Italian because at the time of Caesar, Spain, uh, I mean, Sephardi or Ashkenazi did not exist, be sure. So there are three major groups of Jews? There are many other, but the two major known today are Sephardi and Ashkenazi. But the Roman Jews, the Romani, have, are still today uh, the B- branch group. of the Jewish tree? <laughs> Absolutely. The oldest uh, mm, community living on the same site since about 200 and more years before the diaspora, before Titus. Hmm. Because Roma was the New York of the time. Yeah, what do you expect? Yeah. Jews were yeah, going yeah, there yeah. for business. Not okay. later. Later has lace, but before not. Why? 
Now, uh, on the Catholic churches, we have the bells to call the uh, parishioners to service in. In the Muslim world, we have the callers calling from the towers. How yeah, do no. the Jews tell their worshippers that it's time to celebrate? Shabbat is mandatory. It's the most important regular holidays. And, uh, so Jews your don't... Your family need... name is in Cohen. Yeah, but I'm, I need to catch <laughs> up on my... Uh, I think so... you have to refresh a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Jews don't just go by nature, by the sun, when the sun goes down, See, that's They it. should, I mean, um, when a boy, the, the ma major age for a boy is 13 years, right. and with a bar mitzvah, they should have it tonight, and they, uh, so I can't, I mean, I don't know if I'm the very best person to tell you all these kind of details. But, but every Friday, the sun goes down, people come here? Let's say that every week, there every is week. one day, which is the important day to remind everybody, and uh, which is the day during which nothing has to be made, work, etc., etc. It's a day dedicated to praying and to so, stay together. So they all knew that at the sunset and sunrise, heck, there is something That to day do. doesn't have to be Saturday? Can it be any day? My dear. It has to be Saturday? No, I don't answer this question. You have to, have good, to, to check a little. No, only Saturday. But Saturday... The seven day. But Saturday... Yom Shishi, you don't remember... Anything about that. <laughs> Saturday wasn't a weekend in the Middle Ages, was it? There was, there was just Never Sunday. Never a week, Sunday. The, because the Christian change, they adopted Domin Dominica, Domenica. You know Domenica, what it means. It's the day of God, the Dominus. So it's thanks to the Catholic Church to and Jews Christ that we have a weekend. I think both together, yes. Thank you. <laughs> we, we can get along. Okay, so what's next? Is there anything else we should be noting on the facade? Uh, well, the style. I mean, what happened was there was a competition for the new huh. temple and also a lot of discussion of where to build it because we are not in the area where traditionally was the ghettos or whatever. The problem was that... Um, when they started to finally decide where to build, and etc., cetera, and, cetera, and they decided finally to buy the lot here in the 60s of 1800, Florence was um, going to become the new capital of the just born United Kingdom of Italy, temporarily, waiting for the Pope to retire to the Vatican, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem was that to find a lot down the city center was not easy. They didn't find anything proper because orientation had to be toward Jerusalem. So here, if we're Do you facing where, Jerusalem... No, Laura, here... Echo. The street that you see there is dating from Middle Ages. All this land was non-built. There were only few construction up to the city wall of early 1300s. It was not built forever, for, for centuries. 1800, this became, after 1865, the new nice quarter, the less new nice quarter of the city inside the perimeter of the city wall. And for many reasons, it became more convenient to buy the lot here because they wanted to have a grandiose explanade, garden, and the orientation was correct. Uh, they made a competition and it was won by the Jewish architect of the community and other two non-Jewish that collaborated all together. Were any non-Jew were non-Jews allowed to compete in that? Uh, take non-Jews allowed to compete in that competition? Sure, or? sure, 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 sure. And two, there were three architects: the Jewish architect of the compu uh, community, plus other two Christian that already made. I mean, they were collaborating all together for this construction. This was the choice to have a Moorish style, Arabic style, Oriental mm. style, which was, uh, I don't know, in Brooklyn, there are other, there is a, is small, is much smaller uh, scale, a synagogue that remind the Oriental style. Too. In Brooklyn? Yeah. Huh. 1802. Uh, yeah, it eh? does have a uh, Arabic uh, look. look to it. Yeah. Even the, the, two, uh, the choice of the marble, or the stone here, on purpose, it doesn't remind us uh, the Duomo of Florence, the white, uh, green, etc., uh, etc. Et but the pink. white, pardon? This is pink and white. Uh, let's say the light color is a um, travertine. It's reminding us, on purpose, Jerusalem stone. 
Have you been to Jerusalem? Not yet. Ecco, you will see, uh, that is a classic color because it's a local stone there. This is for you, I don't, don't forget to get it. Thank I mean, at the back of the map, you have a short description in Italian on English. And here you have the map of the ghetto, the former ghetto that was knocked down together with all the central part of Florence on uh, late 1800, to modernize the area, where is Piazza della Repubblica, but not because Jews are non-Jews. It was a question of the uh, urban... Uh, urban planning. Urban Thank you planning. very much. Echo. These are the victims, the Shoah victims, and the names. Uh. And uh, so it became definitely an unbelievable new building, one of very, very outstanding structure. Uh, but it was not the very first. The other city were starting to have enormous synagogues in their mind. I mean, for the glory of their emancipation also, a question of... We already had in Tuscany a wonderful, enormous synagogue in Livorno. Mm. You know the story, more or less? I've heard of it, yes. Uh, and dating from the 17th century. So even older than this, I don't think it was this big, but it was very big. Because in uh, Livorno, that was a porto, was a porto franco, so they wanted to improve. Uh, so what happened country. during the war? Uh, you know that uh, Jews and, I mean, there was a golden moment. When this was conceived, the president of the Jewish community was so wealthy, he and his family before him in business, etc., to Ken. Uh, leave on his um, will all his money because he wasn't married and he did have children to the community to build this. That's it's really amazing in only eight years to build it. What business was he in? No, no, exactly. But uh, it was it's a good... his name was uh, David Levy. Just to give you an idea, he was not the only wealthy Jewish person in Florence. There were few family that had important room in. Uh, intellectual field, in business, in politics. So uh, there were important men in the national government. I mean, don't think it was... Uh, you also should have to read more uh, the beginning of fascism and the Jews, how Mussolini was, when he founded the fascist party, had some Jewish uh, uh, people during, between the founders because he had not at all at the beginning any anti-Semitic politic. So um, the were people who believed in fascism, even between Jews. Uh. Things changed completely later when uh, Mussolini, um, when Italy invaded Ethiopia, and Italy f found itself isolated. I mean, don't please check by yourself. And in uh, 1936, uh, Mussolini made uh, allegiance with Hitler. And then after two years, he arrived to racial law against non-Aryan, the touch in Italy, Jews first. So here on this monument, we see a lot of the members of the same families. Were these people deported? Sure. All these people didn't come back um, after the, the camps. I mean, Birkenau, Auschwitz, and others. What you see here, this is a plaque of 1951. <coughs> Uh, where you have the name of Florentine Jews. Either those are from Nathan Casuto, that was the rabbi of Florence, really during the darkish moment, I mean, early 1943, I mean, up to uh, late November 43, when he was deported, down to Volterra, all these people from Florence area and from other areas of Italy where they were staying. I mean, don't think that these were Florentine Jews, but they could have been for other reasons somewhere else. All these were deported. How many Jews survived the war? The 80, more than 80 percent of Jews survived the war in Italy, yes. And how did they survive in uh, Florence? I will tell you. Anyway, those are the names who died up to Volterra in camps. Fucilati, six people that were shot somewhere, and six partisan Jewish men who died in different attacks. How they survived? Because 
of the help of the church, before because of the help of partisan, of good heart people, even very simple people that did a lot when they understood the problem. So and did that mo more Jews survive in Florence than in other cities? No, or? no, no. Let's say that more or less consider that Elida and her Italy, because up to September 33, up to Italy and Germany remain allied, Persecu physical persecution against the Jews was non officially allowed. No one was being sent to camps? No. Um, other kind of camps, if they were foreigners that were here for other reasons, but non um, prisons uh, from where they were deported to Poland, etc. No. Uh, there were, but afterwards. So, just to give you an idea, you have to consider that uh, when they lied to enter Italy on early July 43 from very south, don't forget they enter Sicily first, and then near Naples, etc., they started to push up to north, Italian army, and the king of Italy and the government of the time, they were fascist, Mussolini was still prime minister. I mean, what they did, and the understanding that the war was going to be f lost in some way, uh, they prefer to prefer to sign the armistice than the defeat, just to make it easy, what happened? It happened a situation, uh, the chaos, because the king did not inform in time uh, his own army. I mean, I have not a Jewish origin. It's a choice as an adult, it's a complicated story. My father was uh, uh, an officer, of Italian army with his soldier and he was together with the German for many months during all along the 14, uh, 1943. Who informed that this king changed position in the, in the war and the people that were sharing their life in the camps and moving along Italian coast were no more the best friends but the enemy. The German were the guarding prisoner. So it was a complete chaos afterward because Italian army people didn't know if to hang up the hands, to shut, etc. Which created what? Mussolini was imprisoned by the king, liberated by Hitler, brought to northern Italy, and at the point in time, he really gave freedom for the hunting against the Jews. So the city was occupied by the, the Germans? The whole Italian land, except Sicily, because it was liberated, was occupied by German. The German came here from north in three days without having any opposition. The army was... So what happened was that one of the first steps the Nazi did was to go to the police office or to the city hall, I don't remember honestly, and to ask the list of names and addresses of Jews because because of the racial law, they couldn't work in any public office, in any institution, etc. So, so the police of, had those lists? Oh, everywhere I had a list. So this, when they enter here, they already had a well-prepared base for that. Were the and Jews the rabbi immediately understood the danger and asked help to the Archbishop of Florence of the time, that is now honored in Yad Vashem, such a help very much. What is Yad Vashem? Yad Vashem is the famous museum in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, sorry, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the Shoah Museum. So, like Schindler. Schindler list. Yes, Yad Vashem is older than the Schindler. And there you have the uh, all the research, cross research that is made between this, that, and that. So, um, it's the best place when someone wants to have information about some names, etc., etc. But just to give you an idea, the just, the alley of the just, I mean, the alley de juste, when someone saved Jews, like the Archbishop of Florence, uh, has the right to be honored with a name, with a plaque, and a olive tree planted there. Is that the famous, uh, it's also the museum of the Shoah, but also where people that save Jews are honored. So how did he physically save Jews? He didn't physically save Jews. He saved 
He moved an organization, created an organization between uh, Casuto, the young rabbi, other young mm, people of the, uh, or consider that they will close, uh, people of the um, community, other Jews, priests, secular Christian. It was a team of young people that to started hide and to, to find the places. The to find places and also to bring food, to buy food. I mean, they had to, people that were in shelter needed to eat. Somewhere. It was an organization. It was an organization, it but there was a spy that entered the organization. And that is why Nathan Casuto and other people uh, were so found and deported. More could have been saved? Sure, sure, sure. That's, I mean, when people ask me, uh, ah, but it tell me, but Italy were so good, they save 80% of Jews, more or less. Momento. Here, there were from very south to the north to April 45, when officially they were finished. We had the Nazi occupation only for 18 months. I mean, think about northern Europe, how long was the occupation there? Five, six years? So, obviously, there is a great difference. Mm. We may say that obviously there were people who betrayed Jews. There were, any kind of human being, don't think it was uh, all good heart. Let's say that not even in any city, the clergy, the official leader of the clergy, the official uh, great personality of the clergy were so, I mean, collaborative. Not at all. They were in places where they didn't even look. I mean, so you always have to see history, it's step by step local places. This is interesting for you. This plaque next to the war plaque? It's the same plaque, I mean Shoah, but these are non-Jewish, Italian Jewish, but non-Florentine. And foreigner Jews. In total, we have an official number, which is 311. The number of those that we know who they were, etc. So why another plaque? because that date from 1951. Who knew the name of other Jews than from many other cities of Italy? They tried to go down to the area where the Allied already were. There were a, a crossing of people going down. I mean, and obviously they found themselves here for some reason. And some of them obviously were catch and uh, even foreigner. Why foreigner? Because Italy already had Foreigner Jews that try to do the same. It's a complicated. Sorry. Uh, excuse me, just a moment. Okay, Giovanna, so let's take it inside the synagogue yes. and you can give me an idea of All what right. we can see in there. With pleasure. Huh. Are most of your tours in English or in Italian? No, most of it's in English. Most of my. Uh, clients are Anglophone, so uh, most of them, United States or Canada, from Canada or United States, or um, Australia, South Africa, so most of my clients are Anglophone. Uh, otherwise, in French, in, uh, in Hebrew, unfortunately, no. The guide who was doing the tour in Hebrew for me back to Israel, so at the moment I don't have anybody in Hebrew. Can you tell me what this is? Mezuzah. It's where there are written a few words <coughs> from the uh, from a special play, prayer. And you're supposed to touch that when you go in? The religious though. Huh. I, it's a very complicated, I made a conversion, the orthodox conversion proceed but uh, I didn't finish because I told them I did everything there. When the rabbi asked me what, what my plan was, and I told honestly, I'm not feeling as orthodox as you demand me, so I'm, I stopped at a certain time. I didn't become strictly Jew. You but, still uh, eat prosciutto? No, <laughs> that's no more. <laughs> That's normal. I mean, we cannot enter at the moment because they are making some restoration, and you're going to see this from the top. When will that restoration be finished? It should be finished uh, in a week, more or less. It was something dangerous from the top of the inner dome that had to be fixed. So yeah, maybe I... we have the luck 
to take some photo of the acrobats. I Tech. saw someone working up. Some yes. <laughs> it's, it's very amazing to take photos of them going up and back. Well, all the decor is original. Most of everything you see, it's original. Those are modern lamps now, electrified that. Originally, they were the same. They had the pipes for gas light at the bottom. And there was an elevator, not here. It was in the other symmetrical space. We are speaking about 1882, so it was not strange that an elevator existed in the building at the time. The artisans who worked on the, the synagogue were Jews and non-Jews. No. Non-Jews. You couldn't find that many Jews to with that kind of training. Mm, I I think there were very few. And anyway, they wanted someone very expert in anything. They really spent a lot of money. It could be on the fullest list. This is still the original. Is that typical? The Okay, now I'll show you the Like this. Uh, this is a map of Florence of late 1500. So it's a photo of a map of late 1500 where you still see existing the city wall. This is the Arno, the river. This is Ponte Vecchio. And you can take a photo if it's easy for you. Some of the wall is still in there. Yeah, only this, from here to there. This is the section of wall still standing. From here to there. <laughs> here is uh, the street of the Jews, where I point my finger. And here, in green, is <clears throat> highlighted the ghetto area. North, south, east, west. And this section of the city center was knocked down barely completely. Late 1800 to make it modern, new urban design. So when you look at this image blew up, <coughs> uh, consider that barely everything that it's around the single here doesn't exist anymore. Here was the new food market hall, fish, meat and vegetable, of, that was set up here on late 1500. The ghetto was originally one block. I point your attention to this column, which is still standing on Repubblica, where the biggest uh, square, which was marking the location of the in some way, it's also considered the city center in coincidence of the Cardo that was from here to there, so north south, and the Cumano east west. I mean, so that was the commercial area. The Roman this, Foundation. Yeah, Roman. Here you see the ghetto structure before it was knocked down. Now, the ghetto buildings were no, I show you. no different than. No, it was. Allora. The first group of Jews, I cannot explain you everything, so try to be practical. Apeta. <clears throat> Take this off, otherwise you have a shade. <coughs> Alor. When the ghetto was set up, 1570, by the same Duke, Cosmo I, who did not make the ghetto in 1555 when the Pope of the time required Catholic ruler to do the same. He told no, he didn't want to bother his wealthy safari in the, sea, in the city that were having commerce with him, etc., etc. But later, 1570, and even a little earlier, when Tuscany was already unified by him, by war, acquisition, etc. It was Duke of Tuscany, which was not enough for his um, ego. And for many other reasons, he decided to set up the ghetto. In exchange of that, for sure, we think, nothing is proved by document, but it's a question of logic. He obtained by the Pope 
the title of Grand Duke of Tuscany, so a step up in uh, uh, no nobility. At the time, Jews in Tuscany had one choice, three, cho what, three choices, uh, to leave, to convert, or to move to the ghetto. What he did to set up the ghetto? He bought a block down the, at Finicia, down the very central area, where the commercial area, but non elegant commercial area, the commercial area that to be at the time, and some confusion, dirty, dusty, etc., was in a miserable area of the city. And what he did, he continued to rent to Christians the houses, the shops and houses that from bottom to the roof faced the square and the streets around, okay? So it created a kind of belt of Christian um, renting them too, and Jews that had to take the spaces inside. <coughs> so they they close uh, there with were great, gates here. Yeah, yeah, with uh, with gates opening. How they created? I mean, narrow street, narrow lanes was easy to set up. So Jews had to get inside to rise up to their floor. So having internal spaces to you, and everything was set up. The special oven for their breads. The um, uh, and they say where they kill the animals. I don't have the the name in. Uh, Do we know a time the gates were opened and closed? Not exactly, but it was sunset and sunrise, so more or less you can imagine. That's the day was organized according to the light. I mean, and <coughs> sure, Jews had to wear a mark to be recognizable. In later, early 1700, Jews were so many that the Medici had to buy another portion of land, etc. Then, mid of 1700, as I told you, things change. Mid of 18th century to understand each other. Later, Jews bought the internal area that was, uh, became their properties. When they started to leave out, and we know for sure early 1800, when there was the first city census, there were about 110 Jews living in the city and more than 200 living out. What they did, they rented to Christian the apartment that they left because they were earning it. Something that the Jews in Venice could not do because they weren't owning the house. They were renting the house by private property. So Christians were allowed to live within the ghetto? <clears throat> sure. I mean, Christian already lived on the, the houses on the edge. So let's say people who face the street from, this, from the window were Christians. Was that a valuable place to live, a good place to live? Uh, no, no. no, no. The rent was cheap? The rent was fixed by the, the Medici. Well, not cheap, because they wanted to, don't forget, they wanted to force people to come there, so they didn't try to make their life so lovely and easy. Got it. Hmm? I got these uh, other images of typical object and uh, very important element <coughs> for ceremonial ceremonies that take place in the synagogue. This is the Sefer. Don't forget that we here had in 1966, so 51 years ago, a terrible flood. Did it reach the synagogue? See, it reached the synagogue because the land here is very depressed and down, you can't see from here, arrived to two meters of height, so seven feet and a lot of uh, scrolls were damaged. Many, many, many. This was restored, but it's no more kosher, it's no more intact, so it cannot be used. And they decided at the time to display in the museum. What is interesting, like all these objects have some special functions. This is what they read during the uh, <coughs> Shabbatot, during Shabbat, or during the holidays, depending from the, the moment. But if you need something more specifically about the religion, or should be better you ask uh, 
someone yeah. else, I mean, not myself. Now, is a, is a scroll like that similar to a, a, what a Roman scroll would have looked like? Sure. They Scrolls use the same everywhere. Uh, the technique? Roman synagogue or ancient Roman? Ancient Romans. I think they had to use the same technique because it was the easier uh, way, even the pipe, come si dice, papiro. Papyrus. Papyrus were ruled. But in this case, I'm not sure 100%. Because they also could, um, come si dice, bind huh? different. But let's say that in general, because this is so long, they read one piece per week, no? Every Shabbat. So it's the best ways to rule this way. Mm. But if you go to the <coughs> archive of the uh, Cathedral of Florence, they have from 1,000, even probably 900, so 10th century, uh, they are parchment ruled. Because obviously it's, it's the only way, because they are longer. <coughs> what you can see here is amazing. Um, it's, uh, what you can see there, it's an unbelievable element. This is a modern uh, decor, I mean, it has been made to remind us with gold uh, powder to remind us how the original decor on the wall, and that you have to work with fantasy, was. So, what you see, greenish brownish was originally finished all the wall downstairs and probably here. So, what happened? Goldish. It oxidated because they, not to use real gold leaf, too expensive, they use. Uh, copper, copper powder, and that's uh, with a little bit of gold powder, but that's oxidated. It faded over the years. Uh, obviously. And that is how the scroll is dressed. Cover with a cape called mail. I mean, I suggest you to buy the little, there is a, a little catalog, it's five euro only, uh, in English and in Italian about this synagogue and the museum, so you can better, with the, um, how do you say, the term, terminology. Mm. Oh, cavalry, I don't have the word. Don't anyway, <clears throat> the crown, the two decor that fit the points that it... Why is dressed like this? Why has a crown? Because... It represents God inside. What is written in, inside is the Torah, the five uh, books, let's say. That. And so that is exactly what we have to follow. Uh, it's the basic uh, book, I mean, uh, written by Moses, but dictated by, by the Lord. I mean. And so when he received that, it's the symbol of the law. That is uh, the same for Christian, that portion. Um, so the crown is to remind, is a, like God is like a king. And the two decor to cover the point of the scroll where it's rolled all the text from beginning to end. So the rabbi doesn't wear the crown? No, we don't have a king rabbi. <laughs> oldest object owned by the community of Florence, according to what I heard from the director of the museum, which was a very important professor of the university in Florence, Dora Lisha Bemporad, and you see, it reminds us a little bit the dome of our major church, the Duomo di Firenze, but six instead of eight faces. They, it had to be a couple. There were two to cover the two points, but one has a very complicated story to tell you, doesn't it? And what is this used for? To cover, to decor. To decor the top of this element. Okay. Ready? Yes. These usually were gift. Uh, I mean, a father had a daughter or a son marrying in the community of Florence, what they could do. I mean, uh, they, they, they offer, when they started to be a little well, I mean, they offer, or a group of people paid for um, the crown, uh, for the two points called also 
is the material Rimonim, silver? Sil only so. silver can be silver mm, golden plated, but never real gold because after the destruction of the temple, gold was prohibited to be used. What was really gold was the menorah, the famous menorah that is depicted in the Arcus of Titus in Rome. This. So traditionally gold, after the last, the second destruction of the temple, never real gold was used anymore in uh, any scene of Interesting. When they design it, obviously you can imagine that they wanted to do something to compare also with the great churches of the city. So what you see, you see two elements. On the left, the pulpit, the rise up platform. On the right, at the back, you see the organ. You see that, the organ at the very back? They play the organ? They thought to be very strictly orthodox, even if in the very past they paid Christian to play during the religious services. <laughs> now no more, no more. Music isn't generally used within yes, the... Yes, yes, but not... The voice, yes, but non-instrument. You can have a choir, absolutely. But in this case, only men, because women had to stay separated. Is it possible to come during a service? Sure. Especially if you say that your name is Alexis Cohen. What if you're a... <laughs> if you are not, yes, A non-Catholic uh, or a non-believer or an atheist? You can or... come too, obviously. But better if someone know you. I mean, if you're a foreigner, show a document, something. Because security is very high now, you know. Was there, has there ever been uh, attempts at... Uh... Crossing finger and touching wood. <sighs> it's hard to tell you because now every day... In Rome there was a... Uh... In 1982... And a child was killed. I mean, and that's the reason why, we, since then, here, we have security with soldiers, even in Florence. Not because here really something terrible happened, but it's a famous um, monument also, which you know, who, who knew? I mean, just... And so what happened was that <clears throat> there were one or two soldiers. Not, now there is a massive presence of soldiers taking care, walking around. You don't see that much where they are. No, not if you're there a lot. Giovanna, I'd like to thank you very much for this I'm wonderful sorry. tour. No, <laughs> what are you sorry about? This has been uh, very eye-opening. I'm uh, sorry not to tell you much more, but... Uh, you've told us already a great deal that we didn't <laughs> know, and uh, it's very interesting. Okay, so it was nice to speak with you.